Uh, so hello, my name is Gunai and I am a, research, a researcher at Technical University of Berlin and Weizenbaum Institute for the Network Society. And my research is concentrated on uh, bias and discrimination in computer vision models. Hi, uh, I'm Roman Lutz. Uh, first of all, uh, really excited to be here. Uh, I'm a software engineer uh, working for Microsoft's Azure Cloud Platform, particularly on Azure Machine Learning. And uh, my team uh, mostly focuses on responsible AI, particularly in our case, that means working on open source tools to support data scientists, um, building their models in a responsible way. Uh, I'll, talk a little bit later about FairLearn, so I won't um, spend much time on that here, but yeah, these days I work in open source and machine learning, and my background is in distributed systems and machine learning, uh, which I got from uh, my master's at UMass Amherst. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks a lot again for the speakers. Uh, I'll be moderating today's talk. Um, I'm a founder of Open Ethics and Chief Technology Officer at Pocket Confident, where we built a virtual coach that is powered by natural language processing. I have experience in building neuromorphic architectures, and uh, most of my career I've been working on human-computer interaction. That this is my passion, in in putting users at the center of the process and and building systems so that users are benefiting. Uh, this system. And also I'm Microsoft alumni probably that got me in connection with, with Roman as well. Okay, so guys, I probably let's start from, from, from this moment and uh, Mikola, the floor, the floor is yours, the, the screen is yours. Uh, let's start. Okay, right, let's start. Nikita asked me to give a general introduction into fairness in machine learning AI uh, in the context of uh, thinking how, how we can move from general discussion about fairness towards its formalization and implementation or making things operational. So consequently, I would like uh, just to set the scene and uh, talk a little bit about uh, this need for formalization and then some of the challenges and solutions uh, have been developed in the research community. To follow this perspective, uh, I suggest you to think about AI and machine learning as an optimization process. So, so we have uh, some form of uh, big data metrics that is provided as an input to machine learning pipelines, where our goal is to, to explore the huge space of possible models, possibly hundreds of millions of possible models, such that we search for the most uh, uh, accurate one, or the one that has uh, the highest generalization accuracy, or something that uh, we want to optimize for. And, and uh, this is one of the crucial parts uh, in um, our machine learning pipelines to think how we translate our business problem to a machine learning problem, to machine learning task, and uh, define what are we actually optimizing for. And then to, in this context, uh, I also invite you to think about uh, the following reflection. So on the one hand, we can see AI and machine learning systems can do, can perform better and better. Like in many specialized tasks, they can outperform humans. Uh, it comes to full automation of uh, different decision-making processes, uh, whether you think about search engines, recommender systems, but also uh, many decision-making processes where there is lots of uh, at stake, for instance, deciding whether someone would wait for a trial at home or will be put into jail, whether someone will be given a loan and so on and so forth. So on the one hand, uh, such AI machine learning systems can do pretty well. At the same time, all of these models are not perfect. They're not 100% accurate. And consequently, if there is room for mistakes, we can think about different types of mistakes that uh, machines can make. And uh, some of these mistakes and corresponding trade-offs are very well studied and well understood. So for instance, uh, most of you heard about precision recall, bias variance, robustness, flexibility trade-offs. So those uh, are very well studied from a theoretical point of view, and we have uh, lots of ideas, lots of techniques how to optimize 
of how to search for the most suitable model uh, considering these various trade-offs. However, when we think about uh, fairness, the question comes back, uh, what are we actually optimizing for? So if you think about this uh, optimization pipelines, uh, what would be a way to reconsider this uh, generalization error or some other measure of accuracy that uh, we are hoping our model to achieve? And then this leads us to some of the immediate uh, considerations of uh, thinking about uh, fairness awareness. So, so let's change the optimization function, let's change the metric we want to optimize for, and uh, let's say turn it into a cost-sensitive uh, uh, prediction or cost-sensitive classification problem. Or let's think how to do multi-objective optimization, such that instead of optimizing just for accuracy, we will also optimize for accuracy and some notion of fairness. However, this uh, landscape is uh, much, much broader. So, so if you think about machine learning process as something starting from the training data, where we have our uh, predictive features and then some subset of protected attributes and uh, some historical class labels. So our goal is to train a classifier such that it would perform pretty well on previously unseen data in a uh, real application. And then uh, now we want it not only to generate uh, uh, labels accurately, but also satisfy some form of uh, uh, fairness constraints or fairness objectives. And then uh, one way to look at it is that we define these metrics explicitly and uh, use a reductionist approach in machine learning to search for the best possible model with that cost matrix or with that multi-objective optimization at hand. Of course, uh, we can also look differently at this problem and think like how we can introduce different ideas into at classification techniques or predictive modeling techniques, such that uh, we say that the model induction process, the model selection process themselves already include some ideas of fairness awareness. Anyhow, one way or the other, we need to find a way how to formulate, how to formalize some notion of fairness. And uh, well, this is a tricky problem as such. So, so the notion of fairness is uh, very complex and multidimensional. And uh, the first question, what is the right paradigm or what is the right way to think about fairness? And then uh, some of the attempts uh, look into statistical formulations of fairness. For instance, we simply look into some uniformity of uh, generalization accuracy across multiple groups. Let's say if we want to make an AI system to do medical diagnosis, we want the system to be similarly accurate for males and females. And then uh, the other kind of uh, um, thought about uh, such measures is how to prevent uh, favoritism in decision making. So, for instance, if we have some desirable outcome, whether someone is invited for an interview or not, whether someone would be given a job or given a loan, and then things like this, uh, how can we inform the constraint such that, for instance, someone from a group of female candidates or someone from a group of male candidates would have uh, about the same chance of getting a positive decision. So depending on what uh, kind of uh, um, metric we want to optimize, we will go into different ways of formalizing group level or individual level of fairness. So, so many of those are based on um, ideas of, of just uh, me measuring fairness statistically, we can also think about introducing independency constraints, which effectively says that uh, any sensitive information or any protected information should be independent from the decisions that we generate. And uh, we can think about many other ways how to think about this uh, formalization. However, I think uh, I would leave it for further discussion what might be the problems with such simplistic ways of defining fairness. But just to give you an example, so so one famous uh, one, a famous one from uh, uh, facial recognition systems or gender classification based on facial recognition systems that was conducted a couple of years back is very interesting. So so you can see a statement that uh, software that is aimed at facial recognition claims to achieve a very high accuracy, very good performance above 90% on average. However, if we put the systems at test, 
this representative benchmark, we can identify that actually this happens uh, only in general case, on the majority case. However, if we look into important subgroups, for instance, uh, how good the accuracy is for males versus females, or uh, people with dark skin or white skin, uh, we can see that the system can perform much worse for the minorities or for uh, subpopulations which were aren't underrepresented in the training data, for instance. Again, well, these are some of the trivial examples, but uh, they were picked by the media and, and uh, uh, stimulated lots of uh, research and discussions in this area. When it comes to favoritism in decision making, the situation becomes uh, uh, even more interesting because, again, it, it's, it becomes uh, really non trivial to think uh, what exactly we want to achieve, what is fair, and uh, how it should be formalized, how it should be uh, put into machine learning uh, pipelines. So, for instance, are we aiming at uh, equal treatment or equal impact? Again, do we think about uh, subgroups? Do we think about individuals? And so on and so forth. Once uh, such considerations are done, computer scientists, machine learning, AI researchers actually are very good at solving optimization problems. So, as of today, we can witness uh, really dozens of different measures of fairness that have been formalized. Uh, based on this uh, basic uh, dimensions, whether we optimize for fair treatment or fair impact, individual or group level fairness. And uh, uh, as of today, for most of the popular machine learning techniques, especially in, in, in the class of predictive modeling techniques, we can uh, see fairness aware variants of those. So think about deep learning or random forest or regression classification models of all kinds and all sorts. So, so we have uh, a number of uh, such techniques that satisfy fairness constraints. And uh, particularly early days, uh, fair machine learning solutions could be categorized into three broad categories. So, so lots of things are dedicated to pre-processing, also called data massaging, where we take the first premise that our historical data can be biased. How can we identify these biases? and uh, clean the data such that uh, state-of-the-art machine learning techniques can achieve uh, reasonable performance, not just in terms of accuracy, but also fairness. Of course, uh, in this case, we cannot give any guarantees that uh, we will get to a fair machine learning models. Therefore, there is lots of research put into uh, finding techniques and approaches how to explicitly uh, take fairness constraint into the model induction or in, in processing and then you can see now lots of different techniques for Bayesian learning or support vector machines or decision trees, random forests, deep learning that would go for fairness aware uh, classification or uh, representation learning. And then similarly, we can think about different cross processing techniques that would allow us to optimize for multiple objectives. So I hope during today we'll come back to many of this. Uh, uh, possibilities of how to formalize fairness and uh, what the limitations and trade-offs are. Uh, I would like to close with a couple of statements. So, so we can see lots of uh, research and lots of progress in uh, fairness aware AI and machine learning. Uh, still, computer scientists often use reductionist approach to think about uh, fairness awareness as an optimization problem where we define a new measure to optimize for, and then we try to study different uh, trade-offs and see, for instance, into impossibility results, see into what can be achieved in theory, and then how we can develop concrete techniques to push fairness constraints into machine learning pipelines. At the same time, we can see uh, different initiatives in industry. So, so better tooling is being provided for auditing models, but also for fairness by design. And Fair Leon is an excellent example, and uh, we'll hear more about it today. Uh, last but not least, uh, uh, I still feel that uh, education is lacking. So, so when we train uh, next generations of data scientists and uh, AI engineers, we really need to consider the problem of uh, non-discrimination and fairness awareness in machine learning and AI more seriously. And, and uh, it's not only about educating data scientists, it's also about educating general public, uh, policy makers, and uh, regulators that hopefully will allow us to achieve it. And uh, I think Nikita mentioned that uh, there will be some pointers 
uh, we can provide in a separate place. So, so I'll just uh, leave it here for now. Thanks much for your attention and thanks for this possibility to make a quick pitch. Thanks a lot, Mikola. I, I would leave uh, a space for, for questions to, to other panelists. And then, uh, and then I have a one little question uh, that I have to, to your speech. So, Gunai, Roman, do, do you do you have any add-ons? So, so what I, I guess you would like to uh, you would like to say something or to to what <clears throat> Mikola has mentioned. Um, I. Um... I totally agree with everything that Mikola just mentioned and uh, probably my presentation will be some kind of uh, um, continuation of what he, he have just mentioned. Yeah. Yeah, uh, similarly, um, uh, this is a fantastic foundation. Um, I love that Fairlearn specifically was called out, so um, you're already familiar with that then. Um, yeah, uh, lots of important things to consider there and, and um, yeah, I hope I can uh, build on that with, with what I have to say later on. Thank you. Yeah. Mikola, my, my question to, to, to what you have just said refers to, to, the, to a pre-last slide, I guess. And uh, uh, what, I want to, what I want to ask is, what should be the choice or the process or the thinking process of the data science team that is building the the AI decision making system when they're trying to understand which which method to apply. Should they treat the data first, and uh, for example, to do a, a data resampling or 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 naive resampling or just multiplication of the underrepresented data, or should they skip this part and work only on algorithmic aspect of fairness and and uh, and the code and the uh, and the statistical features, or should they instead think uh, think about doing the processing and seeing whatever it brings, and then and and then dealing with the with the decision space and understanding how to how to work with ex with current decisions, how to how to limit them, or or how to uh, how to change their statistics. What would be your advices to to approach this? Uh, well, excellent question. Thanks. Uh, I'm not sure how much time I have to, to follow up on it. Um, so, so my short uh, answer would be, it, it is really important to understand uh, what uh, real world problem we try to solve and consequently what we want to achieve. Well, what is the ecosystem we, we are dealing with and uh, how the models that we will deploy and use consistently and continuously would affect this ecosystem. Um, I would really uh, recommend every data scientist to read uh, the book uh, Weapons of Math Destruction by Kathy Nail. I think it provides uh, deep insights into what can go wrong and, and uh, how to think about this translation from real world to machine learning world and what could go wrong. And uh, another important point is that uh, machine learning is not just about uh, training a classifier or just uh, fine tuning a model. It is a process, process that starts from business understanding of real world understanding and translation to a machine learning problem. And uh, throughout this whole process from data collection or data understanding, if you already have data at hand, to all the pre-processing steps and modeling steps and evaluation steps or audit, self-auditing steps. Uh, at each of these steps, you need to think about uh, fairness uh, perspectives and see what kind of solutions would be suitable. So, so this is a general remark. So when it comes to a question, uh, what solution to choose, uh, I think uh, it's much longer question to discuss. In, uh, sorry, 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 I meant uh, this is a much longer question to answer because I, I think we need to ground it or we need to contextualize it or perhaps uh, we can just pick uh, one of the application areas or use cases and uh, walk it through. Because uh, I, I think it, it, it may depend uh, on what is possible in principle, given an application area versus what you really like to. 
and then, then what kind of compromises you make and then to being conscious about these compromises so so for instance um, if you choose some statistical measure of fairness and then, then you play optimization game i think uh, you can quickly end up uh, with the same problems as uh, data scientists who would uh, blindly pick their favorite tool optimize for best parameters and deploy it into the real world uh, so, so i think we need to have uh, a good understanding well, what the choices are, what, what design choices are, and, and uh, what the consequences of those choices. And uh, I think it's hard to decide to, to, to discuss it in an abstract way. So, so, so perhaps we can come back to this question when we talk about a concrete example or concrete application. Yeah, let's let's it's jump right into into several examples. I guess Gunai is going to bring some of those, and uh, I I'm looking forward to to hear you, Gunai. Thanks, um, so probably you can see my screen now, yeah? Yeah, all good. Yes. Great. Great. Uh, so, um, thanks again for inviting me for this interesting conversation. Um, again, I'm Gunai and uh, representing here Technical University of Berlin. I'm a PhD student and research associate at TU Berlin. Uh, so today, uh, in this short time frame, I will try to uh, just briefly talk about uh, my uh, my research uh, around computer vision models and bias and subjectivity in computer uh, vision models. Uh, and I will try to give some probably, hopefully, some action um, plan for the people who are working on building those models. Um, so I would like to start with uh, with um, understanding that uh, yes, in the last 10, 20 years, we have been talking a lot on capabilities of uh, AI-based systems, but right now we are much more concentrated and we're much more concerned about limitations of uh, those systems. Even though those uh, applications are uh, integrated in major domains, uh, we have to understand that when we have, um, when we're talking about bias, we have to understand that this is not always a bad thing. Bias should be uh, considered relatively to tasks, and uh, when it comes to different use cases, we have to understand that positive biases are there, negative biases, neutral biases are there, so it should be uh, investigated uh, relatively to tasks. Um, as Mikola also mentioned, there are uh, there have been lots of use cases with biased outcomes of those um, machine learning models, uh, also in natural language processing, also in uh, classification models. But uh, the more harm and more discriminatory outcomes we have experienced with the computer vision models, where the system was, let's say, unable to uh, recognize the face of the black woman or it was not even designed to recognize the, uh, the, the eyes of Asian person or when the, uh, the you know, facial recognition systems has a huge gap in uh, accuracy between uh, black female and uh, white male as also Mikala mentioned previously. Uh, yeah. The traditional approach here is that most of the scholars are concentrated on so-called AI pipeline, uh, focusing on design, data, model uh, layers, and trying to understand, mitigate, and uh, measure somehow those biases. Uh, but um, my research is actually going beyond, to be honest, of this understanding. But before going more into details into okay. my research and my perspective on that, uh, I would probably uh, have to go into what uh, uh, into go more into computer vision models and uh, how we are experiencing biases in computer vision models. 
Uh, in some cases, we see that uh, even in the data labeling and data annotation um, structure, there are encoded stereotypes into the data labeling process, which is impacting the disproportional per performance in uh, facial recognition systems or also in object detection. And uh, we see here the correlation, somehow the correlation between the biases we have in society and the biases, the discriminatory outcomes of, of those uh, computer vision models. Uh, here I can recommend some of the much popular tools, probably you know some of them, or if you don't, they are very uh, suggested and recommended. And uh, some of them are uh, are for the data scientists. For example, data sheets for data sets is aimed for data scientists and uh, the people who are working directly with creating data sets. Uh, and it's more in the meta level, documenting those data and uh, having this metadata to be able to have a transparent uh, data transmission. Also, uh, diversity, uh, inclusive images, uh, which is giving an, uh, giving, give, which is giving us opportunity to have uh, open, uh, inclusive image sets. Uh, because nowadays, uh, we like all the the people who are uh, modeling those uh, the systems are mostly using the open data sets as ImageNet and ConvNet. Uh, but uh, it is very important to understand that they are not. Um, neutral and uh, they they are open and they are somehow diverse but when it comes uh, to the very uh, specific uh, use cases and very specific um, uh, let's say data sets that are intended for very uh, small communities these data sets are not actually useful so therefore they are IBM's diversity in faces and uh, inclusive images um, tools which are also available uh, in the corporate level, in the meta level, they are already standards and guidelines uh, from Microsoft, from, uh, from Google, from IBM. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, I think we have to question, uh, we have to question the things that um, if we are going to the, to the research and development, if we are going to the field, are those things are actually uh, applicable or applicable? That's another question that's also somehow touches my research. I would like to talk about it uh, later. And uh, so the promised action plan, which I would like to share here, which is somehow uh, probably um, merging everything that uh, that um, I've been discussing and Nicola was also was discussing. Uh, it is, uh, first of all, considering uh, team composition for diversity, like the, the people in the team who has background and experiences, diverse background and experiences, that is very important. Also understanding that the, the business ta task that you are solving with, uh, with these um, models and stakeholders and potential harms and errors. Uh, most importantly, of course, it's always uh, the, the biases are mostly coming from the data sets and that's why checking the data sets and uh, understanding what it is intending to represent is very important. Uh, and uh, analyzing your data through qualitative experimental surveys and other methods, um, it is also uh, suggested. Uh, also checking models for uh, models and validating results. Uh, here explain, uh, uh, explainable algorithms and justification of the results presented by the model is very important. Uh, it is very use case specific for sure, depending on what are you doing, what are you building. There are different uh, explainability methods, but um, we are also uh, in our uh, research group, we are, we are trying to bring that into the level that uh, explainable explainability should be actually um, uh, experienced and proposed as a, one of the quality assurance um, criteria for, uh, for software and AI based systems and not only computer vision for sure. Uh, also post deployment, ensuring optimization, what also Mikola was also mentioned previously, and continual monitoring, including customer feedback, feedback uh, and always ha having A, B, C, D 
plans for failures and uh, and errors. Uh, that is what uh, that was my uh, was in my mind for as a suggestion for the action plan how people and uh, people who are in the de development teams or who are in data part who are in design uh, they can uh, they have to uh, somehow consider but at the end of the day um, what I'm trying always to bring into table uh, in my uh, presentations is that the bias problem actually goes beyond of uh, so-called AI pipeline. Of course, we have to concentrate on data, we have to concentrate on design of those models and how we develop our algorithms, but uh, at the end of the day, um, we have to look to the structures and infrastructures around the system that we are, we are building. First of all, it's capitalistic structures and the power relations, uh, as I mentioned, there are tools and there are standards, the guidelines, but when you are going to the to the field, uh, it is very complicated and challenged, challenging to, um, to apply those uh, techniques. Uh, so policy level, of course, it is very important to, to uh, consider here. In meta level, the decision makers, what are the priorities and motives of the decision makers in the development of those uh, products and technologies, how the tasks are designed, how the data management is uh, is uh, manipulated, how the transparency between system decision maker and uh, the other stakeholders, and of course the contextual level. Uh, currently, I'm mostly in my research. I'm concentrating on contextual level, the data quality, and uh, understanding the. Uh, encoded stereotypes in uh, in the facial data sets and how they're impacting uh, the uh, how this biased data mining is impacting the further uh, so-called layers of AI pipeline. Um, yeah, so uh, I I, I would like to mention that uh, this is very important also to understand that um, uh, we don't only have to uh, concentrate on one. Uh, so-called layer of pipeline and uh, thinking about that that okay how we should fix that bias is a broader problem uh, and uh, it probably comes from society but we cannot fix the society so we have to accept the fact that we are as humans and society we are biased so what we can do with them how we can make our uh, systems more transparent and uh, regulated in the way that they are uh, at least justify justifying the biases. Um, so yeah, I hope that it was not so long. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm looking forward to extend this discussion further. Thank you a lot for this marvelous presentation. I I'm giving I'm giving the mic to uh, to other panelists. Roman, Mikola, if you if you want to add something. Yeah, I, I think I'd like to mostly echo um, everything that Gunnar has been saying. Uh, fairness is really socio-technical. And, and once we, um, you can look at any kind of example, but once you let that sink in and you accept that, it, it goes beyond just um, yeah, your inputs, your outputs, and, and you have to look at everything, how this system that you're building fits into the environment where humans interact with it. And I think that that really came through and and, um, uh, and, and thanks for, for really stressing on that point. I think that's uh, probably the most important message um, to communicate when talking about fairness in machine learning. Yeah, I can, I can only agree with this. I, I fully support uh, the statement, yes. Uh, perhaps a small question I have is about uh, um, computer vision as a research domain. Uh, do you think uh, in this domain that there are specific challenges which makes uh, fairness awareness uh, even more challenging than it is in some other domains or other way around, like in, in some sense makes the problem space easier? 
Uh, yeah, when I started my research, actually, I was mostly concentrated on NLP, on, uh, on, on natural language processing, because I was thinking that, okay, how we're expressing uh, uh, our biases, we're expressing it through the, uh, through the language. Uh, but uh, the more I dived in into that research, the more I actually understood that yes, we are uh, we are expressing the the biases through the language, but how it creeps in into the uh, into the digital world or the results that we are take, uh, we are receiving from the digital world. Uh, I I. Uh, I thought that it, it is mostly from the visual attributes and from visuals and from, uh, let's say, the recommendations. Let's say I I I uh, I received from um, from um, Google search or the recommendations or the image uh, facial recognitions. That's why I was thinking that. Uh, there is actually the correlation between how we express our biases through language, but how it creeps in into computer vision was even more uh, interesting for me. That's why I, I took this angle. But probably the other, um, other domains are also the same, uh, much important. Mm -hmm. Right, thanks. Uh, I think we are on the same page, considering uh, fairness as a social technical uh, uh, concept. Um, and then I really appreciate uh, your position, uh, particularly in the field of computer vision. So, so, so uh, some of the participants uh, who follow Twitter and other social media platforms could see some of the heated discussions uh, from scholars or including scholars from computer vision community and, and the people who do deep learning. So, so they often see, again, on only a small part of this problem space, thinking about bias in, bias out. And then consequently, well, if we can uh, fix our training data, everything will be just fine. And then they, I really appreciate uh, the perspectives that you brought in your presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, the one thing that I'm concerned, I cannot stop sharing my screen. I think you did already. You did already. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot. I, ha I have one question, Gunai, or maybe comment. Probably yeah, it's please. going to be directed to uh, to every panelist here. In your one of the last slides, you mentioned policy levels and norms. So there was this uh, this line on on the so social level uh, spanning towards the contextual. If you if you take this if you take this spectrum. There has been a research showing that policy, the changes in policy or dynamics in, in policy is much slower than changes in how people make their decisions today, because there is a lot of influence today on, on, on how we make decisions. It is coming from our connectivity on social media and our uh, and the amount of communication we all have. How do you think, how do you think this aspect should impact or or will impact the way we we think about about fairness given given we're so interconnected today and the policy changes are slow and no matter no matter how fast we try policy will always lag the actual way we leave unfortunately yeah i totally agree with you because we also saw this in the field work that we have um completed last year uh the the even if there are in the policy level the standards and guidelines uh, to develop uh, fair uh, systems, at the end of the day, it is all about the human decisions, human culture, and human priorities uh, in the development of those systems. Um, I see it as a uh, as a very natural thing, to be honest, because. Um, at the end of the day, uh, even if there are laws and even if there are policies, uh, in this capitalistic world, uh, the when when the priority is a profit and somehow standardization and uh, opacity, uh, it is it it is the case, and we have to accept it. We we don't have to accept it, but we have to understand that this is the case and. Uh, we 
these people who are in the decision making position or the people who are building those systems their priorities will be always above the policy or the law because they always find some way to <laughs> to you know not to um, have troubles with that uh, i see it as a very uh, huge problem but i really don't have solution for that unfortunately uh, because as I mentioned, it is all about the structures and infrastructures that we have developed in last uh, 20, 30, 40 years around not AI only, but uh, technology and digitalization. Um, probably we have to we have to think about first uh, sustainability versus profitability, like, do we really want to move towards sustainability uh, in the world uh, generally, in the digital world, or we really want to stay in this world of monopoly in digitalization and in uh, information technologies? I hope I, I answered your question, but yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, uh, I, I actually believe a lot in transparency as like a forcing function um, too, and and if it was applied at earlier stages or or more in a pers participatory way where uh, there's visibility into such things, that might also help in many cases. I'm sure um, you've heard of the uh, genderify case that was all over Twitter uh, the last few days, uh, because. It was public at that point. People were able to criticize it, and and those kinds of things are much like a, a lot of harm could be avoided if the transparency started at an earlier stage. Um, but yeah, it's it's a question of power, like you said, um, and the incentives are not necessarily such that um, transparency is is something that uh, helps the, the people who are building the model. Yeah, yeah. Probably I, I sound a bit negative, but I really this all of those developments around the data and uh, transparency in uh, in developing those systems. It is uh, something new, and I hope that in 10, 20 years we will see the outcomes, and we will see that even in the policy level it works. Uh, I, I do agree with, with the comments about uh, transparency and, and that it helps. Um, I, I agree that uh, some sometimes uh, companies uh, may put uh, money first and, and other considerations uh, second. So, so we can think about all kind of aspects of green computing, or fairness awareness, and so on and so forth. Uh, however, I think in quite a few cases, um, it's not about evil capitalism or evil uh, uh, companies or greedy companies. I think quite often it is about uh, also, our by by us, I mean uh, academia, industry, uh, scientists, uh, pe people who develop uh, technology. It is about uh, being more interdisciplinary and, and understanding this uh, social technical considerations, and uh, well, essentially getting to next level of understanding of what we do, well, what are the potential benefits and potential harms, and how to advance technology further and further and how to educate uh, people around us. Uh, and then by people, I really mean different stakeholders. So, so this is business, this is industry, this are data scientists, this is general public and policymakers. So, so I, I don't think that in many cases, unfairness happens uh, because of stereotypes or because of uh, um, meaning bad. Actually, I think machine learning and AI is an excellent example uh, that was an eye-opener for many people that uh, technology is not neutral and we need to think how to understand better fairness and how to inject it, how to integrate it into new technology. So, so by building better technology and by educating uh, different stakeholders, I think we can move forward. Um, can I ask you one thing, Mikola? Uh, because we are actually right now concentrated on uh, education part and we are trying to understand how this uh, interdisciplinary education should look like for different uh, stakeholders in AI pipeline. What what do you think about it? Like, um, 
is it uh, is like this education should it be like in formal education or in uh, inside training or should it be very specific like use case specific education I really would like to get your feedback on that uh, actually I think everything you mentioned applies uh, for instance in Eindhoven we have a data science program or AI in data science program both in bachelor and master and post master and uh, considerations of ethics in technology or responsible data science in particular is uh, part of the program so, so we have corresponding courses uh, if i think about industry again I, eindhoven is kind of a special place uh, in the sense that there is lots of uh, local industry around and then there is lots of collaboration between the university and industry and uh, we, we have quite a few joint projects uh, where companies uh, come to us and, and they communicate very clearly that uh, they are very much interested in issues of transparency and non-discrimination and fairness and then this is from from many sectors including banking finance uh, uh, insurance uh, telecom you name it so so, so uh, there is also quite a bit of demand of uh, training data science teams in industry and then this is something we also do uh, well i wouldn't say systematically but Whenever there is, we, we see such demand and opportunity, we contribute. Great, I will take a look. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Probably what we are going to do now, we're going to jump in with Roman sharing his insights uh, from his work. But before doing this, what I want to what I want to bring to our discussion is to bring a little bit of diversity and I what I mean I what I what do I mean by that I would really like to know uh, where people are coming from and and who is listening to us so what what I'm going to do I'm going to jo to launch a little slide or slide a poll to our discussion to our discussion and see uh, and see who is representing our audience and who is interested in uh, in fairness and AI. So I'm going to launch a little poll and share my screen right now. Let's see, uh, let's see guys, if you can help me in animating the screen and, and sharing, sharing your answers. To, to submit your, your answer, just go and go to slido.com and enter is four, five, six, five, five. I'm going to vote as well. Does the size indicate how many responses there were? Yes. It's it's not I guess so well normalized on based on the number of responses. There's there's probably a limitation, <laughs> but still very interesting. It looks like we have a pretty pretty global community here. Yeah, what I know is that we have what fifty around fifty participants. Yeah, nice, nice to see this. Okay, Roman. So meanwhile, while people are voting, we can always come back to we can always yeah. come back to the screen and and see and see the votes. But let's uh, let's jump into our discussion. Right. Um, let me share my screen. I think that was actually a fantastic um, segue into. Uh, what I wanted to talk about anyway. Oops. 
Um, as, as I've said earlier, um, I work on uh, Fair Learn, which is an open source Python toolkit to assess and mitigate unfairness in machine learning models. But um, this entire complexity around fairness being a socio-technical challenge and not just a technical challenge is something that we face there really every day. Um, I'll, I'll keep coming back throughout the talk, but um, uh, to the same topic, but um, I think it's important to recognize that uh, anybody can build toolkits like Fairlearn or, or improve them, but the, if, if you want to really address unfairness in your models, a technical tool will only do so much. Uh, it can definitely help in uh, certain tasks around building your model or, or understanding what it's doing, but uh, you have to understand the the social context in which your uh, model is going to be embedded or your, your broader AI system. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really not going to use this as an advertisement too much. Um, just perhaps um, if, if anybody's interested, everything about Fairlands open source, you can check it out on GitHub. Uh, the link's on the bottom right. I'll share it out later uh, as well. Um, and we very much encourage community contributions. Uh, you're, uh, in the process of building a community and um, at this point uh, have several people from outside of Microsoft contributing. Um, so but when when looking at oops, should close this. Uh, when looking at uh, Fairlearn what we provide is uh, an assessment which I think is the most broadly applicable part um, and what, what this does is you can look at various kinds of metrics. Now you might say, well, I already use other packages for metrics, uh, like for example, scikit-learn, I can look at my accuracy, my F1 score, whatever is interesting in my application. Um, uh, Fairland specifically is right now targeted towards group fairness, so you can use these exact same uh, metrics that, for example, scikit-learn might offer and apply them um, to uh, groups that you can specify. So for example, uh, if you have a uh, face recognition system, like the one that uh, I talked about, you might want to look at accuracy per subgroup. Uh, perhaps those subgroups are um, defined by gender or by race or intersections there. Intersectionality is always very important, of course. Um, and then um, you don't just want to have these metrics, but you want to visualize them. There are many ways of doing this, and I'm, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but uh, this is um, the, uh, one of the visualizations we have there. And, and broadly, you, you can look at a variety of different models. So each of these dots here represents a model. You uh, can plot your performance on the x-axis. In this case, accuracy is selected as the performance metric, but there could be uh, other ones, balanced accuracy, for example, if that's more relevant in your application. And you can look at uh, a disparity metric of your choice. In this case, I think it's selection rate was uh, chosen here. So the percentage um, of rows with label one within a certain subgroup. And then what you're really um, looking at is the disparity between two groups. So the one with the largest and the smallest uh, disparity, and you're looking at how much difference there is. So ideally where you wanna be is somewhere close to zero, then uh, with respect to that metric, you're treating everybody equally, and you want to have high performance, high accuracy in this case. So ideally, you want to be down here in the corner. Uh, and then often what you see is you perhaps start out with a model like this uh, that has fairly high accuracy, uh, but also high disparity. And by applying, for example, if you notice this and you say, okay, I know exactly this is my uh, fairness constraint that I want to enforce, uh, if you think back to what Mikola talked about, um, for example, I think in this case we applied demographic parity because that seems to make sense in the application. Um, then you can use Fairlearn's mitigation algorithms and perhaps uh, create other models that are somewhere along this um, parietal curve uh, and, and then uh, choose what sort of compromise you want to make. Uh, commonly, this is referred to as the fairness accuracy trade-off. Um, for example, you might say, well, I want to at least get below 0 0.06 in disparity because that is relevant in my application, and then I'll take the one with the highest accuracy there or something like that. 
Uh, but again, this is super context specific and all of this, uh, both the visualizations as well as mitigations, only really makes sense if you have decided at that point that I know exactly what, what fairness means in my application scenario, I can quantify it, and um, and then I can use Fairlearn. Um, if you are not sure about these, you can certainly use Fairlearn to assess various kinds of metrics, but uh, I do want to point out there are applications where um, perhaps it's not as easy to quantify fairness into a metric. Then we have to be very careful about uh, how we build models around this. We have to understand the entire socio-technical context. And this is uh, something that keeps coming up for us as we talk to uh, people using the toolkit. Um, so a major shift has sort of occurred over the last, I wanna say, uh, six months or so, where initially we were mostly focusing on building a toolkit, and now it's more about how can we help the people, the data scientists that use it, understand how to how to work with this, how when not, not to work with it, and uh, how to think about these sorts of problems. And um, that, that same sort of um, tension comes up there that Mikola tried to capture earlier, I think, which is there are no generally applicable approaches. Um, the, the one thing that I usually point people at first is uh, this fantastic paper um, called Fairness and Abstraction in Socio-Technical Systems. And I'm, I'm not going over every single detail here, uh, just picking out one. But uh, this is probably uh, my favorite paper that I've read in the last five years or so, um, because it's super readable, um, very accessible. There's no math in there, as far as I know. Um, and it really captures what kinds of traps you can fall into if you just come with your usual uh, software engineering mindset that at least that's very close to my heart as a software engineer and and you come with the same sort of um, mindset and apply it to machine learning fairness um, and and i'll give uh, one example of this um, using the portability trap that's out there and I'll, obviously i'll share the link for this afterwards as well um, so with the portability trap, um, that's all about uh, the failure to understand how repurposing algorithmic solutions designed for one social context may be misleading, inaccurate, or otherwise do harm when applied to a different context. Um, think, for example, uh, about what software engineers uh, or also data scientists do in their day-to-day -day life. We, uh, we have a task. We start out, um, has anybody else done this? So we go on uh, our search engine of our choice and uh, look it up. And perhaps there's somebody on Stack Overflow on, or in a GitHub repository who has done this before. And a, a common practice for many tasks there is to um, copy whatever they have and then adjust it to purposes, at least to some extent. Um, and that, that's not a bad thing per se. Like in, in many applications, this makes sense. Um, when applying this to machine learning and fairness and decisions about actual real world scenarios, that can lead to issues though. Um, fairness, uh, I think Mikola had it on one of his slides. Uh, there, there are something like 20 plus different definitions of what fairness can mean. And those are only the quantifiable ones. Um, I'm sure one can come up with more than that as well, but those are the, the most commonly used ones. Now, if you imagine how complex a, um, a socio-technical environment is where you deploy a system, say for example, to um, uh, make decisions on whether loans are approved or not, or, or at least provide probabilities or rankings on which loans should be approved and which ones should not, and then a human takes decisions. That is a fairly complex environment um, with uh, a lot of things you have to factor in there. You can't just take this and then applied in a different scenario, let's say uh, in a medical context, uh, who uh, should get preferential treatment because of high risks to their health. So, so what fairness means in there is fundamentally different because the context is different. So we shouldn't fall into that trap of, oh, I'll just take something from one context and, and port it over to the other. Uh, we really have to start asking these the fundamental questions about who the system affects, who is harmed if we make mistakes, 
from the start and then build on top of that. Um, there are techniques to uh, sort of counteract this um, that have actually been mentioned already here before, which is fantastic. Uh, one is uh, data sheets for data sets. Um, this is just a screenshot from the paper uh, by Tim Nitgebru and others. Um, because if you create a data sheet, and, and I recommend looking at the paper itself for much more detail and examples of data sheets, uh, you have to really write down and think about how was this data collected? What was the intent in collecting it? Who is represented in this data set? Who is not represented? What was the purpose for which it was collected? And if you think deeply about all of these things, then chances are you won't use it for some purpose that doesn't make sense in this context. Um, data sheets is just one such approach, but there are others, model cards uh, to mention one. And, and more broadly, the uh, About ML initiative of the partnership on AI, which is, um, I believe, a nonprofit um, sponsored by lots and lots of industry partners uh, in the US. Uh, so that initiative works on a lot of related um, uh, concepts and um, is trying to help contextualize issues by providing more documentation. Um, I hope that's a fair summary of the project. Yeah, um, so now you're probably wondering, well, okay, you've, you've told us now uh, 20 times that the context matters, but how do I, what, what are the questions I should ask about uh, my specific context? I've never done this before. And this is something that we face every week uh, in the Fairland community. Um, and it's hard, uh, quite frankly, it is hard. And I, I strongly believe that the fairness issues we see uh, deployed are mostly due to people just not understanding what the questions are that they should have asked. Which is why I'm so excited that um, uh, this paper exists, co-designing checklists to understand organizational challenges and opportunities around fairness in AI, where uh, some of my colleagues actually at Microsoft Research um, have looked into uh, organizational setups and what kinds of questions related to their data, related to their model, the socio-technical context, uh, a data scientist should be asking and um, while I said before, there are no generally applicable approaches. Uh, I think this is as close as you get because uh, all of those questions you'll see are, uh, if, if you look into this uh, list, uh, which is at the end of the paper, um, if you look at the paper, the questions are quite general, but a lot of them will lead you on, on the track to um, really understanding what your model uh, might affect if you build it the wrong way. Uh, so I highly, highly recommend this other than the um, other paper I, I mentioned earlier about fairness and abstraction and socio-technical systems. Um, in, in practice for Fairland specifically, uh, we also see this of course because um, we want to have example notebooks, for example, showcasing what Fairland can do. And um, those themselves should also respect socio-technical context. So. Uh, otherwise, um, we have examples that uh, show users how to how to use Fairland the wrong way and not actually work according to these values that we're stating. So, um, for that purpose, we uh, we started about one and a half months ago. We have now a weekly session where uh, people bring use cases, and we try to really dive deeper into those and understand what factors are important in the particular deployment context of an application. And for that reason, how we should go about building uh, a solution there or whether we should be building a solution. I think that should always be an option on the table as well. Um, so I'll cut it short here and just um, summarize. Um, we've, we've said a few times now, fairness is inherently socio-technical. Uh, there's no way around that because that's just how fairness is. Um, Fairness metrics are by default quantified, so you cannot capture things that are uh, not quantifiable. And you cannot satisfy all fairness constraints that are out there simultaneously. There's a, a very nice theoretical result there that showed that this is not possible. 
uh, for certain combinations of fairness constraints. So you really have to choose the one that makes sense in your scenario. And uh, finally, um, since I cannot highlight this often enough, tools like FairLearn can be very useful. And uh, obviously, as one of the um, people working on it and, and uh, creators, uh, I'm uh, super excited about the value that it can provide. But it's super important to understand that this will not solve all your issues around fairness. But it can be a piece of the puzzle uh, of uh, things that you're building. Uh, yeah, and that's all. Uh, just um, this is uh, like contact info in case you want to get involved in these sorts of uh, uh, building uh, socio-technical uh, examples around uh, fairness. We have a very active community, so feel free to reach out to uh, the community. I'll drop all of those links in the um, in Discord as well, of course. Uh, thank you, and happy to answer any questions, of course. Thank you a lot, Raman. We'll proceed with uh, with questions now, and uh, we'll start with questions from from panelists. And then we have uh, already a whole set of questions that is waiting for us from our from our audience. Thanks much for, for the presentation. Really excellent. I appreciate uh, all the points you made. Um, I'm familiar a little bit with Fair Learn. Uh, also, well, one of uh, my colleagues, uh, Hilde Weyers, started to contribute to it. Uh, I am curious about uh, your opinion. Like, how difficult or how feasible would it be to deploy uh, individual fairness or counterfactual fairness in the fair learn? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, maybe maybe to take a step back, uh, or yeah, so um, you're right. Uh, Hilde is, is really a, a, a really valuable part of the community at this point. I was, I was just on a, a call before this where we were talking about these example notebooks, and uh, she's a very um, active participant in that as well. Um, so thanks to to you to you Eindhoven for for the contributions obviously um yeah I'd like to take maybe a step back and say uh everything that that fairlearn is focusing on so far is really to group fairness so you're looking at uh, uh perhaps demographic groups but this is defined by the user so you can look at um are we how are we doing with respect to gender for example or with respect to race or combinations thereof uh age uh, what have you, whatever is relevant in your application context, obviously. Um, other notions of fairness are, um, for example, individual fairness, where you're trying to compare with other, uh, for each individual compared with others. So you, you want to, the, the basic idea being you want to treat similar people similarly, and that is fair. Um, so far, we haven't done too much into that direction. Uh, because uh, I guess the majority of the research has focused on group fairness. Uh, it's absolutely a direction we want to explore at some point. Uh, but right now, the, the directions that we're going into is uh, mostly driven by what users are asking for. Um, so um, uh, it, as soon as somebody basically from the community says they want to do this or uh, or somebody asks for it, I'm sure we'll uh, endeavor into that direction. Uh, I think it's very relevant because with uh, in group fairness, you can still, depending on how you define your groups, um, miss parts. Um, there are very interesting stories. If you know a little bit about intersectionality, um, you can be fair with respect to, for example, gender and race, but you can still um, be unfair towards an intersection thereof. For example, uh, you might be hiring um, uh, a lot of uh, men and, and a lot of women, and you might be hiring uh, black people and you might be hiring white people, but it could still be that these aggregate statistics don't show you that you're actually not hiring women of color. And that those sorts of things, you've introduced a, a new bias in a way by selecting what groups you're looking at or which intersections you're looking at and which ones you're not. So I think individual fairness has a has a very interesting spot there because 
you don't have to do this sort of choice in, in terms of which groups you're looking at. But then you have to make a different choice, which is what's your measure of similarity. So it, it's definitely one that is on our radar, um, but I don't have any concrete plans to share right now. Uh, and counterfactual fairness is uh, really fascinating, of course. Um, so more like looking at um, uh, what if, um, if you go back to the uh, a loan application scenario, for example, what if uh, this applicant was male instead of female? Would the loan have been uh, granted and those sorts of things? Um, it, I, I think it's super interesting. I, I, I'll admit I'm not super well versed in counterfactual fairness, but it strikes me that um, depending on your application, again, um, this may or may not make sense. For example, um, uh, other features may be dependent on on an individual feature that you might be tweaking. So, uh, yeah. It, it, it's interesting and uh, definitely something that tools like Fairlearn and, and others will explore at some point. Uh, I'm sure of that. Uh, but right now, it's not something that we have uh, in the toolkit itself. Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks. Yeah, I certainly recognize uh, some of the challenges. Uh, let's say if you go towards uh, individual or counterfactual fairness, uh, you, you immediately face uh, new challenges like how to model domain knowledge or how to understand, uh, let's say, which dimensions are important or not when you compare individuals. Uh, but I thought that uh, it, it may lead to further developments, which of course may require further resources, let's say, connection of uh, fairness and transparency. And then when it comes to individual and virtual fairness, this is a natural way how to bridge the two. Uh, but I think more generally, again, it can be extremely useful at the same time a little bit dangerous like, like these examples you mentioned uh, so that uh, if you optimize for group fairness again in some blind way it can again lead to different uh, kinds of uh, unfairness and, and i don't have an ultimate answer like what would be the best way to develop a system like fairlearn so such that it is useful for both data scientists and decision makers but yeah, that's a really fascinating area. We can continue, but, but uh, I'm afraid that I can uh, take time from someone else who would like to ask, to ask a question. Yeah, we have a whole uh, set of questions right now and uh, the new questions are coming. So I have one tiny question to, to Roman perhaps that is related to his personal, uh, personal work in, in Fairlearn. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have other uh, people who contribute to other fairness uh, frameworks here to, 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 to talk. But what my question is, Roman, how do you see the, what is different in Fairlearn compared to other, uh, other open source framework? What point of view are you taking in Fairlearn compared to, compared to other? Is there any differentiating features that, that that some some may should have in mind when choosing uh, one framework against the other. Yeah, I'm. Uh, that's a great question, and um, perhaps one that I should have addressed already in the uh, in the, the session before. But um, the the way I look at it is that um, I, I'm certainly not going to um, uh, talk any of the other tools down. I think they all have their place, um, just like Fairlearn does. Uh, there are absolutely algorithms that are in ours that are in others and vice versa. Um, for example, if you're, if you're looking at um, IBM AIF 360, it will have a lot of um, uh, unfairness mitigation algorithms that are not in Fairlearn. Um, and we have some that they don't have. Um, the difference from my perspective is really that we have, uh, we're putting more of a focus on socio-technical aspects. Um, a huge part of our time right now is spent on uh, working with the community to come up with actually responsible use cases. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you give somebody this tool and they just come back to you and say, well, but how do I use it? Or, or even worse, they don't ask these questions, they go ahead and apply it uh, sort of blindly um, and convince themselves that they've made a model fair 
without understanding what the socio-technical context is that can do more harm than good at the end of the day. Now, um, because of that, we're shifting a lot of attention towards making educational materials. And I think that is uh, a huge differentiating factor about Fairlearn as a community. Of course, if you just do pip install Fairlearn and, and you install the toolkit, you're not getting us. So you have to um, uh, sort of look through these educational materials and actually uh, be open to learning about these. But uh, I think this focus on uh, capturing the socio-technical context properly um, is, is the differentiating factor. And in some cases, that finally just means that perhaps we shouldn't build a solution at all. Um, but, but that's, uh, I think, the right thing to do at the end of the day in some cases. I hope that helps a little bit in, yeah. in terms of... Yeah, uh, thank you, Roman. You, you gave an angle, I guess. You, you gave an angle for, for, for thinking. And that's, uh, with, with this angle, I, I want to... So, so right now we, ha it, it, we have 10 minutes before the scheduled, scheduled end of, uh, of our today's meeting. And I want to make sure that we do respect the time if someone of the speakers cannot cannot stay any more on this call and I know Mikola has has something on his on his schedule. So I, I want to jump right away on questions to Mikola that that both of them fr from the list of questions relate to education. So the one is who should be educating uh, those who program algorithms? And another one is uh, how how can we educate the general public about fairness in AI? I, I'm I'm fusing those questions together to to discuss a little bit on on the education piece and what's your view on that? Um, well, who should be educating? I guess uh, anyone who who can should, and and uh, should should try to do their fair share in in, in this. Um, when it comes to educating the public, uh, I think again, like many people. Uh, are involved. People from universities do all kinds of outreach activities. So do people from industry. Uh, you, you can think about different organizations that try to promote uh, particular values. So for instance, in case of Europe, uh, there, is, there are different European agency and uh, fundamental rights agency is one of those. So they conduct lots of surveys, they, they do some of the research and then they publish white papers uh, related to fairness and, and uh, they target uh, policy makers, but also general public. So, so they try to uh, bring the message in a very uh, accessible form to, to different slices of population to explain what uh, responsible data science is or what fairness or discrimination is or what are the human rights values in the context of algorithmic decision making. Uh, there are all kind of uh, other initiatives again at European scale, at national scale. So, so you could uh, see initiatives like uh, uh, presenting what AI is to everyone in the UK or to everyone in Finland or to everyone in the Netherlands. So, so there are specialized courses developed for general public to understand what a new technology brings. So, so, so this is about education, ed educating general public. Well, when it comes to educating next generation of data scientists and AI engineers, so, so I think uh, these days there are many, many places where you can get formal education in data science and AI. And uh, yes, I strongly believe that uh, you need to have uh, some training in responsible data science, different angles of it, and then it can be organized differently depending on what it, what the curriculum and what specialization is. And uh, sometimes it's given by technical people, sometimes it's given by um, uh, philosophy department or uh, ethics department, or sometimes it's again a multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary course where experts from multiple fields uh, come together to develop an interdisciplinary course. So, so I think a short answer is that there is room for many opportunities how to develop education and how to deliver education. 
and I think it is happening already and I expect uh, more of this will come. Does this answer your question? Uh, I hope this answered the questions from from the audience. So, uh, is is anything else that 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 you guys want to add to this uh, to this one? I have a I have a short point. Um, I absolutely agree with everything Miko said. Um, at the end of the day, the interesting part with fairness, I think, is that what is fair is defined by the public. So. It's really up to the data scientists to engage with, uh, well, and if you're ever, we call it stakeholders, but a stakeholder is really anybody who works on building an AI system or anybody who's affected directly or indirectly. Um, so it's really important that when I build something that I understand who this is affecting and how they are thinking about this and what they consider to be fair, because uh, fair is not something that I define as as a data scientist, for example. Right. Maybe it's time to disagree a little bit. Otherwise, we'll agree all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so maybe I'll take this opportunity to disagree a little bit with Raman. Uh, well, not not disagree, but, but perhaps to to give slightly different perspective. Uh, I, I I do agree that uh, uh, general public is an important contributor to to defining what fairness is. But uh, these definitions can be right and or wrong. So, so if you think about uh, uh, many cases, what could go wrong? For instance, with search engine, recommender systems, uh, many other platforms. Well, actually, many things go wrong because systems blindly take relevant feedback and then integrate it uh, to be part of the system. Or well, we as general public contributed to lots of content that now is being used as a training data for machine learning systems. So whether you think about uh, biases in uh, natural language processing or biases in search engines like uh, auto like query after completion. So, so if we just uh, blindly take relevance feedback from general public, again, it can lead to, to different biases. And, and uh, I just wanted to emphasize that this is a two way street. Uh, we, we certainly need to learn from everyone, from all of our customers, our stakeholders, all our citizens. Uh, but we also need to proactively educate. Uh, and, and again, by educate, I don't necessarily mean formal education. I mean that uh, we develop a new technology and then we make people aware of uh, advantages and, and limitations of this technology. And then, uh, then this becomes, uh, let's say, again, a community experience of how to live in the era of AI and, and how, how to make it better. I want to jump in to disagree a little bit with uh, what Mikola is saying, because I don't think that general public exists. What we, what we are working on is not with the general public, but we're working with different communities. And different communities have different cultural norms and the way they are acting on things. And therefore, our definitions of right and wrong may be very much subject to, to, to those communities. And when, when, we're building, when we're building applications, we should be very much aware of the fact that we're not working with a, with a homogeneous group of the general public, but rather addressing a specific, specific group of users. And I think it's on our responsibility to make sure that this specific group of users understand what kind of uh, biases our system can potentially carry if it if it does and if it doesn't carry the biases that is suited for this specific general public what what we can do is to make sure that we that we address our applications or, or our machine learning models to a specific to a specific public to which it may be may be a fit so it's a i i think the definitions uh it, it's a it's a definition it's a definition game I don't necessarily think with these two points uh, in disagreement with each other. Again, I, I'm, I'm trying to say that general public or particular community can be wrong. I mean, we society lived through slavery for, for many centuries. Uh, we society or particular community uh, led, led, led to discrimination of women for many centuries in many particular ways and, and uh, 
So, so, so again, I'm just trying to emphasize that uh, this is a two-way street in the sense that it, we don't just uh, collect the data from our customers. We also bring back some data and some insights to the customers and show what goes wrong. And sometimes we can do, we can act and, and we, we, we can impose uh, some preventive measures. And, and this again can come close to your question at the start of the panel. When is it about legislation? When it's about uh, technology companies? When it's about uh, educators or some other actors? Like who comes first, uh, who takes the lead on, well, essentially making the world a better place. So, so even though we, we do serve the community, but at the same time, I think uh, we change the community by providing new technology, by providing education about this technology. Just so, well, I can repeat again and again, but I think I'm saying just the same thing. I think it is uh, two directional uh, yeah, feedback. Very, very much the same. I was just uh, just talking about the the differences within within the big uh, within the big thing that we sometimes call society and trying to trying to bring one uniform uh, one uniform solution to the whole society that that may not be uh, the right solution. Uh, so thanks a lot. So we have we have more questions jumping in, and um, I, I'll probably address the the following one to to Gunai. Uh, Gunai, there is a question about the computer vision, and the question is, uh, do you have any recommendations of computer vision data sets that are suitable for exploring fairness model? So I guess it's about testing. The question is about testing fair mo fairness model using specific specific data set. That this is how I translate it. Yeah. Uh, so probably uh, the the ones that I the, the the most popular ones actually are suitable for that. If you are a researcher and you are researching fairness, the uh, ImageNet and ConvNet, uh, the open data sets are very suitable. I guess because you will find a lot of um, a lot of gaps there in terms of fairness. Again, depending on what you are researching, what is your research question, and uh, like, uh, are you concentrated on on uh, um, uh, facial recognition systems, or you are um, more into the broader understanding of bias? Uh, I think this uh, open data sets are very uh, like the open for that. Uh, but in other case. Uh, you can always build your own <laughs> and uh, you can create your own. Um, you can treat it as a uh, normal uh, like machine learning uh, or computer vision task and you can do the crowdsourcing and you can uh, uh, create your own labeled data set through, uh, I don't know, Am Amazon Mechanical Turk or whatever. Again, it depends on uh, what is your research question um, specifically in fairness and, and machine learning or and computer vision? Uh, thank you, Gunai. Thank you. And uh, if we're talking about uh, if we're talking about the computer vision, so what do you think is the role that that we have to when working with the with the private data such as biometric data or copyrighted content can we do you think that there there is a question of fairness when we treating this kinds of data or this is a question of only uh, the rights of access um, there is a huge question of privacy and uh, and rights uh, and data protection but in terms of fairness, um, yeah, it, it again depends. Like, if it's it's uh, only biometric data or uh, copyrighted content, uh, like copyrighted, uh, if it's copyrighted images and uh, like uh, if there are human uh, human data actually in those content, for sure there is a room for uh, for uh, um, for discussing fairness. Uh, but from biometric info, um, 
again, it depends on for which purposes you are using that biometric uh, data. Will you manipulate this data to have some predictions based on, I don't know, the uh, background of, of the, those people or uh, the, depending on the gender or ethnical uh, racial background, then yes, of course. Yeah, otherwise it is a huge uh, privacy discussion where I just really don't want to enter right now. Thank you, Gunai. There is one question that, that I, I'd probably address to, to Roman and we will be slowly closing, but all the other questions, what we are going to do with them, we're going to follow up on them on Discord. So every every panelist is actually on Discord, so we would be able to provide, uh, provide the answers there. Uh, the last question for today would be about uh, the systems of accountability. So what are the systems of accountability being established to enforce AI ethics in the world where most algorithmic systems are being created by private companies. What's your uh, what's your take on this, Roman? That's a tough one being an employee of a private company, but um, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll just take a step back here because uh, uh, I'm, I'm definitely not a, a policy maker, so I don't want to assume that role, but um, something that I've noticed is that uh, if you broadly follow AI ethics and related topics um, and and how the discourse happens so far, it's a lot about high level um, uh, concerns, values, um, uh, things we should be thinking about. And, and I'm as guilty as anybody of this, uh, if you've uh, listened so far to what I've said. Um, because it's just very hard to provide general guidelines. And I think um, getting getting more specific to a context, to an application helps uh, because then we can make concrete um, uh, statements. The, uh, there, there are definitely plenty of, of uh, sort of things one can do uh, in terms of accountability, um, on a legislative perspective, but uh, yeah, like I said, I'm not sure I'm, I'm the best person to talk about this. I know that within companies, and, and I, I see a big difference between companies of different sizes, uh, you can add certain levers, certain uh, guardrails to make sure that people think about how they're building their models. Um, I see a lot uh, um, within Microsoft, some of this is now public. I can uh, uh, share a page about this um, on uh, resources that Microsoft has made public on, on what we're doing, how, how we're thinking about things like AI fairness, but also um, other aspects. Um, so, so as, as an employee of a of a private company, I know like the kinds of things that we can do internally. Um, I think the question is more about what can we do as as people outside of a private company to uh, get to accountability. And I am struggling to think of um, anything other than um, transparency, but that would, like I said earlier, I think that is uh, in the hand of legislators to change this because uh, as long as we, as long as private companies don't have to um provide transparency there uh, i mean it's it's very hard as uh, say a user of um a social media company to know whether they their algorithms are discriminatory or a search engine whether it's discriminatory I, it's uh, almost impossible to say from uh in many cases and uh, it's remarkable the kind of work that uh, the research community has done there um, for example, the gender shade study that was cited earlier in coming up with um, some of these results. But it's really hard and it should have been a lot easier if you think about it because um, if, for example, on those face recognition data sets, they had published a data sheet and a model card that outlines certain statistics, certain assumptions, uh, how the data was collected, 
um, it would have been a lot easier to hold um, the creators of these models accountable. But um, again, I'm not a policymaker, so this is um, uh, not really the, the kind of um, thing I can address in my day-to-day -day life, unfortunately, uh, with respect to accountability from holding companies from the outside accountable. Maybe I can add a couple of uh, remarks uh, in this context. Well, first of all, I think this is a great question, and uh, it's a question that is very hard to answer. Um, accountability of uh, and, and auditing of uh, AI systems is an open question, both methodologically and, and uh, with respect to availability of, of tools, how, how to do this concretely. Uh, however, we do see a number of examples of so-called computational journalism. And uh, gender shade is just one example, but uh, there are dozens of such studies where we can think of conducting some form of controlled experiments or benchmarking, which would help to identify uh, biases or unfairness in algorithmic decision making when we have only access to API and nothing else. Uh, indeed, uh, so there are lots of limitations of what's possible and what you can conclude from this. Nevertheless, this can be done and uh, people do this on a regular basis. Uh, the other aspect is that uh, there is a kind of uh, call to move from computational journalism towards uh, certifiable AI. Well, when we talk about fairness by design, so, so can we think about some form of how to certify that a deployed model or algorithm that training pipelines which led to that algorithm actually complying with regulations related to fairness. Uh, there is no good answer to this question but again like well this is an active area of research where, where people study how, how to think in this direction. Then we also shouldn't forget about uh, traditional auditing practices that take place for instance uh, in many industries which are strongly regulated Think about banking, insurance, and, and many others. Um, auditing algorithm decision making again is hard, but uh, possible, and, and uh, it can start with a low with with, with a low case with, with a with a suitcase and uh, low suitcase, and uh, then, for instance, a third party or a regulator can get an access to the model or to the data that was used to make a decision or data that was used to build a model and so on and so forth. So, so, so you can think about uh, well, modern data detectives who would actually do auditing. And, and uh, some of such uh, decisions uh, are public. So, so for instance, a couple of years back, there was an example with one of the Nordic banks, which was sued and, and uh, it was uh, shown that the bank indeed was, show, well, well, was uh, doing wrong in decision making. So, so it was discriminatory and, and uh, actions were taken to prevent this. And uh, we also shouldn't forget about GDPR, which stimulates uh, both research and industry to think about uh, such auditing practices. Um, it, it's uh, not uh, very much operational, but again, it's an important step. So, so again, many companies have been triggered to ask for help. How, how shall we do self-audit or how, how can we ensure that what we do is right? Especially companies uh, which are in industries which are heavily regulated. So great question, many challenges, uh, but uh, there is progress. On this progressive note, I would like to thank all speakers and what we are going to do we are going to be closing this meeting today uh, i i would like to thanks say a big words of appreciation to every single attendee who joined today and every single panelist who joined today because this is our step towards educating our our society and uh, our communities in and first of all, raising the problems that we uh, that we are facing, that we're going to be facing. Uh, all the resources are going to be shared in Discord, and uh, you could always contact um, me 
uh, in the community and join uh, the Discord channel, as well as join uh, Open Ethics for further uh, further updates on our platform. Thank you again, everyone, for for joining us today. Thank you, Gunai. Thank you, Mikola. Thank you, Roman. And thank you, everyone.